All right. Well, that's Josh He is the nicest guy to run this You can figure out a Hunter series. Oh, that is bright. Yeah, that'll be fun. The lights down. He's just working in the right way. Yeah. Oh, my photographs are great. They did. Well, someone on Facebook posted a note. One of my grad students said, you should, you should figure out a way to get your photographs. Got my sick drink. So afterwards, I don't know. And then afterwards, Luis or somebody, Kevin's yeah. going to go through the audience. What he's doing? That's it for Q and A. Good evening, everyone. Is this, is this on? Can you hear me? There we go. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Boy, packed house tonight. Fantastic. Well, welcome to the Explorers Club. My name is Michael Wyrick. I'm a member in the uh, Washington, D.C. chapter, uh, or the Washington Group, as it's known, and uh, traveled around with this guy a little bit when he's, when he's let me. And uh, so I was asked to, uh, to make the introduction, and I, which is my honor. Tom Paradise is a geosciences professor and the former director of the King Fod Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Arkansas. He comes from a diverse, diverse background in the geosciences, architectural, and historic material preservation, Middle East, Mediterranean, and North African regional studies, and cartography GIS. Having researched the unique architecture of Petra Jordan since 1990, he has published more than 60 articles, reports, white papers, and chapters on Petra and Wadi Rum, and continues to advise the US, UNESCO, and foreign agencies on cultural heritage management and architectural <laughs> deterioration, Mediterranean and Middle East architecture and geographic visual visualization and cartography of the region. Professor Paradise was awarded a Senior Scholar Fulbright to Jordan from 1998 to 2000 and was the Joukowsky Distinguished Lecturer for the, Ameri the American Institute of Archaeology for 2021 and 2022 for his work and research on Petra and Wadi Rum and the historic preservation of ancient and classical sites. The, uh, this last May, I had the pleasure of traveling with Tom uh, to Wadi Rum on a, a Explorers Club uh, Discovery Channel grant that, uh, that was awarded for the purpose of studying giant mega sand dunes in, in Wadi Rum. And the purpose of this was to uh, establish a baseline for studying, using, uh, studying the effects of climate change uh, on, on these mega sand dunes and, and determining the way they're formed. Are they formed by prevailing winds? Are they formed by these uh, phenomenon known as the Hamsin, which is the 50 days period in the spring in the desert that, that generates these, these, mega, these uh, giant sandstorms. And so that's the basis for the study. It's, uh, and for the purpose of establishing a baseline, we're doing two different uh, expeditions. One was last May, and the follow-up will be th this coming May. And he's a fantastic, uh, fantastic explorer, professor, and friend. And I would like you all to join me in welcoming Tom Paradise. Thank you, Michael. You can hear me OK? Everybody's OK? Um, can I have the lights down? I guess as dark as possible, because these, these photographs are pretty 
spectacular. I'm so very proud of these, these photographs. If we can get as dark as possible in this room, I'm not sure. I should warn you, my eyeglasses glow in the dark, so if they turn off, <laughs> literally, it's the best invention ever, and so if they turn off that spotlight, you're gonna see these weird, creepy, green <laughs> frames around my face. Best invention ever, because you always find them when you're waking up. All right, I guess that's it. Is there a way to turn off the big spotlight, Luis? It doesn't bother me, because I, I have the, I don't need any, a little better, yeah, okay. All right, I'll end up speaking like this anyway. Okay. There's no way to turn it off all the way. I feel like I'm gonna be, I feel like I'm gonna be, oh, excellent, excellent, good. I think I needed sunblock for a bit. Okay, so the reason I was invited here um, was because of this more than 30 decades of work, but I wanted to say that what's especially exciting to me is when I was inducted seven or eight years ago into the Explorers Club, having been nominated by other explorers and other people because of my research and work, and of course I've done stuff on TV over the years, I never realized that I would find a new tribe in life. And I really felt like being in the Explorers Club was especially exciting to me because I met other people that did crazy, lovely, stupid things <laughs> on other places on Earth. Now, what's amazing to me about the Explorers Club is that we look at people that are you know, diving the deepest, they're climbing the highest peaks, they're floating through space, but I'm especially excited because you don't meet as many desert rats in the group. And so I'm really happy that I've spent so many years in the desert growing up in California and in the American Southwest that the desert has always been a big part of me and so working in Wadi Rum and Jordan over all these years is nothing but yeah, kind of an extension of my loves and passions. So I'm gonna to talk to you about the, my last 33 or 34 years of working in Petra, and I'm gonna sprinkle it with my personal experiences, but also talk about the science of what we found over those last couple of years. And what, what I think is just another paper here or there after a while becomes an opus that actually creates a foundation for other people to do continued research um, in Petra, and as a professor as well, this also includes mentorship and students, many grad students, PhD and master students over the last 30 years as well. And that just makes me smile from ear to ear. And you'll see some pictures of these guys um, along the way. So let's talk about what's going on. So some of this is basic. I'm not gonna do a lot of tour guiding today on this trip because I've been involved with, and they're all over TV, a number of TV shows on Petra. Right? I was really lucky to be a principal with NOVA's uh, Lost City of Stone that is still the most watched um, PBS special in history. So that means a lot to me, and we'll talk about that little briefly at the end. But here's some of the basics when we talk about Petra. Petra is really heavily occupied um, from 500 BCE to the present, but it really becomes notable um, as the kind of jumping off site for the 12 tribes and Aaron and Moses, right, in 1250 AD, uh, BC. And so this is what really made Petra so famous, and that is, that is Mount Hor, way up there, which is now called Jebel Harun, the mountain of Aaron, and that has been a pilgrimage site now for 3,200 3, years. It still is um, a pilgrimage site, but nowadays you pay a Bedouin in a shake and bake old truck to take you up to the base and um, take you up to the base and you get to go visit. You cannot go inside, that's a welly, it's a shrine. You really can't go inside. Um, but we were fortunate in the old days when I started to work there because UNESCO got us into the site. We were able to descend into the tomb of Aaron and we never found Aaron, but we found more than a meter of melted wax on the, on the floor of the tomb. And so we, we think Aaron's buried there under, right, 3,000 years of candle wax, but we're still not sure. But it was creepy, because in the images of Indiana Jones and the bugs, right, we couldn't get out of our system. And we had probes to measure the wax, and we were, thank God, that it was paraffin and beeswax and not bugs. But that's Jebel Harun way, way up there, and you can see Petra from the peak. But I want you to get a, an idea what an important pilgrimage site this is, because the pilgrimage site is now either closed at times or basically off limits to tourists. You really can't go up the old way. And you can see in the photograph here, you can see 3,000 years of footsteps carved in the old path going up. 
And so this is why Petra was so important at the time and still has a little bit of that sort of essence to it. So in this photograph, this is a different view from the Petra side, and that peak on the top, that little temple up there, um, is currently a welly or a, an Islamic shrine. But again, it was a Christian site, a, a chapel of sorts, and before that, it was a Hellenistic site, and so on and so on, back to the times um, of Aaron. But this will give you an idea why the path is currently closed, or, or it's actually very difficult to recognize to find, because that's the path up to Jebel Harun. So in 1990 and 91, 92, this is the path, the only way to get up there, because we didn't have very accessible roads at the time. Um, now the Bedouins, the local Bedul tribe, have built these really nice sort of gravel roads, and they'll drive you up to the top um, that's a, that is on the backside. It's about that height. The, the truck goes up to about there. You can't tell, but on, this is actually a mountain on a mountain on a mountain, and you can see there's a platform here, and then there's another little plateau up here where the trucks drive, so you don't have to walk very far to get to the top now. But in the old days, this is the way we went up there, and I never feared heights until I started to do this regularly when people would come to visit Petra and it was creepy because there are times the path gets down to about a foot wide and there's nothing below you but sandstone crags, right, that would just rip your limbs, right? They'd find me as burger at the bottom, not a corpse. Okay, and here's the backside of Jebel Haroon. You really get a sense that, see, it's a mountain on a mountain on a mountain and the truck can take you up to about here, I think. It's about in there. You can also go up on this side, but this is another little scary zigzag that goes up. But it's an odd mountain on a mountain on a mountain. The University of Helsinki has been doing this work here, where they uncovered a fully mosaic church, and we think it's a 5th to 7th century cathedral. So we know Petra, you'll see it in a bit, we know Petra was a bishopric. It was the seat of a bishopric about the 5th and 6th century, and this sort of confirmed it as another church that was way up there. Why it's this far up and inaccessible, we don't understand other than it might have been an, an, a hermitage, like the monastery, another site you'll see. And that's Petra right there. That's the Valley of Petra to give you an idea. So when we talk about the valley, this is always both offensive and interesting, but a lot of the history books talk about Petra was unknown to the West until uh, Johann Burckhardt in 1812 will go through the region. He will fake that he is Sheikh Ibrahim al Abdullah, and in doing so, he will sneak in saying he is going to sacrifice a lamb on Jebel Harun, and he realizes he has to pass through Petra proper to get up to the top of Jebel Harun. What's sad about this is that he will publish, these will be published 22 years later, sorry, 20 year, 10 years later in 1822, but he will have died long before then from dysentery. So uh, Burkhart really doesn't even realize what kind of gate he opened um, to, the, to the West when we were fascinated with his writings of the region. The only thing about this that I think is not fishy, but a little bit over-dramatized, is that I have a map, uh, personally I have a map, um, from 1790, written one of the earliest English maps of the region, and Petra is completely identified on that map in English. So uh, he was the first to publish, but there are maps published 10 and 20 years before him that identified the location of Petra exactly. So after he writes, who shows up right away within a couple of years are the artists. So we always joke, we don't see any of the of the sweating tourists that we see now with the visit Petra, but what we saw was a really sort of sophisticated colony of artists and writers. The earliest of the of the painters at the time are mostly gouache artists. Leon Laborde and Linon Belafons are doing work in 18 in 26, 27, 28, 29. Belafonte is famous for something else altogether, if his name sounds familiar. Belafonte was a cartographer and an artist that will become the engineer that will identify the path for the Panama, no, sorry, for the Suez Canal in, to open in 1869. So Lynette Belafonte is very famous in the world of cartography as an important cartographer, also an extraordinary artist, but really more famous for having identified that path that is now the Suez Canal, and that will open 
you look at the numbers, that'll open in 1869, so that'll be another 40 years or so that he will become famous for that. But it's this guy. David Roberts will publish a couple years later, um, will will start publishing little bits and pieces of his work about Petra, but then he will put them together in a large book that's called The Holy Land. And his images were epic, many in size. Um, when I started to work in Petra, they were selling at auction for twenty, forty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, and now an original David Roberts is $150 to a half million dollars. Um, spectacular gouaches. What's amazing is how realistic he painted the sort of the geology and the architecture of the region. Here's David, there, here's David Roberts, 1839, a later version, his view of the urn tomb, and this is the urn tomb today. So it's really re quite remarkable on how realistic his squashes and dry points and illustrations were at the time. So, right, coming from a university setting, we have to deal with context, right? So let's talk about context for the region. There's the country of Jordan. Those are fake boundaries that I put in myself, right? We don't see those from space. Um, but it'll give you an idea of where we are. And there we are. There's the Mediterranean, the Dead Sea. And here we are. There's Gaza, Israel, West Bank, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia for context. So Petra sits right on the edge of the Wadi Arabah that separates southern Israel and the Negev with southern Jordan. So we're going to we'll talk a little bit about Petra, then I'll talk about work, and we'll go back and forth, talk about all kinds. This is so fun for me to talk about this stuff, because right, this is a very different setting than a classroom or a lecture. right? Um, so when we talk about Petra, I always love the term about discover. I always find this fascinating. And the word discover is used a great deal, right? That Petra wasn't discovered till Burkhart. Petra wasn't discovered until scholars show up at the turn of the century, right? And so Petra was very well known at the time. It's part of it is just publish, right? These are people who published. So yeah, they became notable for their work. The person that is often overlooked, we'll talk about, in the early work of Petra is, of course, a woman. The very first is Gertrude Bell. And, but the two men that have become famous are a linguist and a, a, linguist and a geographer named Brunow and Domaszewski. So the B and D terms by those two men are still used to identify every structure in Petra. So we identify them as B and D 12, B and D 825, named after these two guys. Um, that published in 1905, but, but Gertrude Bell had already been there with photographs, and they're spectacular. These are, this is the entrance to Petra. This is the obelisk tomb up above, and the triclinian tomb down below. And but I, I put these in here because I wanted you to see the sort of eclectic Hellenistic nature of the architecture. The obelisks at the top feel like something Egyptian, and you look at the bottom, and that looks completely classical. Right? And so this is typical. The Nabataeans were a commercial um, trading crossroads. And so they adopted and adapted all of these traits um, because they're dealing with tourists that are coming from all over the region. So it, it really reflects in their architecture um, until they're rich enough and strong enough to create an architecture that's all their own. And I'll talk about that in a bit. So the thing that's odd about Petra and exciting at the same time is it's always been only accessible through this narrow canyon. The canyon narrows down to about two meters, and you walk in just under, it's a little over a kilometer to walk in. And I always love the phrase of my students that this is just like the best walk to work ever. <laughs> because in the old days, we lived in the valley, and then we were kicked out of the valley by UNESCO in the, in the kingdom of Jordan. It's OK. And then, but we would stay in dumpier hotels in Wadi Musa, the main city outside, and this is how we walked to work every day. And they just thought that this was, and I would, you know, deal with this and saying, oh my God, I just want to get there. And the students were like, oh my God. And you know, the students at this age in this kind of setting, they're working at a negative, they're walking at a negative five miles an hour, right? <laughs> and I just want a cup of coffee with the Bedouins, and they're looking around, and they're poking at the trees, and those are, those are fig trees up there, and it smells like figs. I don't know how many times the students say, oh, I need to experience the smell of a blooming fig. And it's like, no, I want, 
I know a Bedouin that will make me a double espresso, <laughs> right, in a, in a couple minutes. So Petra's also famous because it's had a, a fairly continuous water source for thousands of years. So in basic Arabic, that word Ain Musa means the fountain or spring of Moses because up above Petra in the town of what is now Wadi Musa that used to be called LG, the original name is LG, is a fountain that has never dried up. And so many legends poke at that as the um, water from the rock. Right. And so that's the city. Of, that's why it's called Ain Musa in the, in the village of Wadi Musa that is now the home to, <laughs> right, one to two million tourists a year. And so the seat gets narrower and narrower. It widens in a bit and then narrows again. But this is what it looks like at its narrowest. It's about six feet. And this is some of our work. This is digital drone imaging of the Sikh all the way from the beginning here where you walk in, where you saw the Triclinian tomb right, was right here, and that's the zigzag you walk all the way. If you notice, there's certain, there's certain sort of parallel cracks in it. This is a combination of earthquake faulting and what we call moment faulting, moment joints when, the, when that sandstone was forming 550 million years ago, some of the earliest sandstone on Earth, it developed cracks in the formation, and those cracks over time have worn into um, a water passage. And of course, here's one of Gertrude Bell's earliest photographs of the Khazne or the treasury, photographed about 1900. She's often overlooked in her work, and I find her work right, riveting and very important, and the Explorers Club has a relationship to her as well that's very exciting to us, because a couple of years ago, we discovered some of the earliest maps of her narrated paths through the Holy Land and the Middle East by her. And they're here in this building upstairs. And we're very excited about that. And we were very instrumental with Lacey Flint and Kevin in finding these and working with these maps. This is what the Khazneh or the treasury looks like today, to give you an idea. Um, it's hewn from the rock, which makes, makes it especially spectacular. And what's interesting, if I added this photograph specifically right here, because can you see this weird cyclone fencing area? We've had a hunch over the years, because we had done probing in the region, that this flat area in front of the treasury is nothing but de very, very deep sediments. Um, a little money was, was <laughs> dug up um, by UNESCO and the Kingdom of Jordan to excavate, and we found a whole course of shops down there. That was a strip mall, a strip center, right? With, you know, you know doing your nails in a 7-Eleven. And so what happened was, this is at the nexus of major um, creeks when it floods. And so what happens was, we think in one event, this area flooded with 10 to 20, 30 feet of sediments, and they just gave up and said, screw it, we're just going to build something new. And so they just ignored those with all the sediments down below and then carved this magnificent facade. And again, it's hewn out of the rock. What that building was used for, we're still not sure, but the location reminds us that it was an important part of the kingdom of the Nabataeans and was probably used both for receptions but also for state funerals, right? There's also a little door in the inside. If you look carefully, you'll see a little door with an opening above. We, you'll see that in a minute. We think that was actually an, an oracle. So here's a better view to give you an idea looking down, and it gives you an idea on the immensity of the size, right? And that's all hewn from rock. These, all, these bas reliefs all here, we think these are um, jubilant Amazons. This represents Victoria, victory. So they have a certain symbolism, and these are acroteria that are typical of Greek architecture. This is called a stola, this, this circular object. So there's nothing here that's surprising to us, but what we love is this eclectic use of Hellenistic architecture at the time. Later, we're going to look at another building in Petra that is more representative of what the Nabataeans finally said. We're sick and tired of Hellenistic architecture. We're going to create our own, and they do, and that's what the monastery is on the far side of Petra. There we go. So I'm going to show you a couple sites because we're going to look at them later. This is the theater. This is the the my this was my home for four years between 1990 and 1994. I was I wrote my dissertation on this 
structure and I, I lived in there, oh my God. And I became very good friends with all the Bedouins that had shops across the way. Um, my students always remind me that they love that when you, theater, theater um, etiquette was very specific to the Nabataeans like it was to the Greeks and the Romans. And the students love the idea that you always entered the, oh, you always entered the, come on, let me go back. That you always entered the theater, always entered spaces through an additus, and they loved it because you always exited through the vomitus. <laughs> and my students love it. I hear students on campus saying, they'll do it on purpose. Is that the vomitus? And I'll tell you now, right, 90% of the time, it's a male student that gets very excited over the word vomitus. And it makes me laugh because I know it's a setup, right? So that, that theater you saw probably held about 10 to 15,000 people, we think. Then as you leave the theater, you're around the bend. This is an area called the Outer Seek with the UNESCO tombs. So there are over 800 tomb facades of this type in Petra, give you an idea. All of them were carved between about 50 BC and about 150, 200 AD. That's it. Then there's the royal tombs, which I love. I love these. They're called the royal tombs just because they looked royal, and they all have names. There's the Corinthian tomb, the palace tomb, there, 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 there. The tombs have all these different names. And that's the urn tomb in the middle with the staircase that David Roberts so beautifully painted in 1839. Then nearby, I was involved with this. This is the Byzantine church. In 1991 or 1992, um, I was sitting on a rock with an archeologist there named Ken Russell, who's long passed away. And my wife and I had studied, as a weird hobby, um, mosaic restoration and conservation in Ravenna, Italy. So it was like for us, like a fun, weird thing that, right, people do. And so they called me, so we noticed a lot of tessery sitting on the ground, Ken and I, that were just sitting there, and Ken pulled out a shovel and started to dig, and the, the frequency of the tessery increased as we went dig, dug deeper. We put everything back, and because I had been working, I had worked with mosaic tessery before. Um, he, we got a chunk of money through the American Center of Oriental Research, which is in Amman, Jordan, in UNESCO, and we ended up getting money from USIS and USIA, right, through the US government, State Department, to do this. The whole church was excavated, and this is only one aisle in this church. It's spectacular. What's exciting about it, and you can't quite see it well here, but on this side of the church over here, along the other aisle, um, they found papyri, papyri that have been um, um, deciphered by the University of Helsinki in, in Finland and represent some of the best representations of historic pieces at the time during the fourth and fifth century. And it was not even the intention of excavating this. We wanted to show mosaics. And to the Jordanians, they were excited because they knew mosaics meant tourism, right? So to them, it's like, oh, more people come in. To us, it was just exciting because we also realized that by the fourth and fifth century that Petra was a bishopric that Christianity had already um, raised its head in the region. Now, that being said, do any of these images represent anything involving Christian ideology? None. There are none. If anything, Neptune is in here. There's Eresiden right there. Right? And so none of these represent any aspect that we would consider the least bit Christian at all in ideology. So that, that's when you realize that you know, this is a faith, an institution that is only developing, that's trying to figure out what's going on. And the symbology, right, we really see Christian symbology raise its head in the medieval period, right? During this period, there's nothing here that indicates anything at all other than it was indeed a church. Now, where I'm standing here at this part of the church is a large synthronon, which is also very unusual. And we realize those are common for churches at the time. It's a little mini theater. It's like three or four little benches. And we realize, oh, if you were a priest then, you'd be pissed because that meant you, we think all of the clergy had to sit through every service in the church regardless if it was their service or not. So the synthronon is used for sort of the higher, higher ups, the elite, to have to attend something. Now, remember the idea of a synthronon. It's like a little mini theater, 
right? Remember that because it has a huge effect in another building that we did not see coming. And that's what the Brown University team uncovered in this. There was nothing here when I started to work in Petra, and this was uncovered while they were uncovering the, the Byzantine church, which we are facing, it's behind us. Brown University got involved with this, and they didn't know what it was. The more they dug, the more they found. And this was an open plaza right here with a propylea, now a grand staircase, right? But what's interesting is when you went up the stairs, up the stairs, right there is another synthronon. And we realized these were used, this was a city hall. And when you had a gripe and you wanted to go bitch to the mayor, you would go and all the city officials would sit in the synthronon and you would stand in the middle and explain your issue. So it's kind of like the microphone at the city council that we still deal with, but this, they, this is later than the Byzantine church, we think. We're not sure, but it's interesting to see a city hall with a little mini theater inside. Um, I love the idea. And of course, gotta say it, Attitus, or the monastery. One of my students did his dissertation on this specifically and came up with a lot of work on this that it was probably another hermitage. It was probably where the priests lived when they weren't working in the valley because Petra had part of the main street was also used as an off-limits um, temenos, a region where the priests lived and you would go to like visit church, right? So we're not sure if they lived up here or if they came to worship here alone, but uh, this building set off something weird in our heads because we noticed this building has been, see how it's been kind of wiggled when they were carving it, how it doesn't quite fit. It doesn't look like it would be the natural way you, well, guess what? This building is facing exactly, exactly, exactly Jebel Harun. And so red flags went up when we said, you know, no one's looked doing work on solar, lunar alignments and the architecture in Petra. And we hit pay dirt over the years over this, and I'll talk to you about that. So it's a crescent-shaped valley. It's been called the Valley of the Crescent Moon off and on. We're not sure who coins it and who first uses it. However, it is indeed a crescent. And what's amazing to me is you really see it when you're, when you're looking at satellite images, it's hard to see. But when you create what we call a digital elevation model, you can see the crescent right here. So how, when you're in the valley, you don't see it, that it's crescent shaped. But when you go above it, even with satellites, it doesn't show up. But when you start to look at topographic maps, digital elevation, it becomes very obvious. And so this is the way in where we came in at those two at the two, um, the two early ones, the triclinium and the obelisk. And the seek here is kind of, it's so narrow, it doesn't show up. There's the inner seek. The Chazne is right there. We zigzag through. There's the theater right there. Then you pop up in the main valley. These are the royal tombs in here, right over in here. And then this is the main valley right here. All right. And this here drains down, down the mountain and drains into the Wadi Araba that separates southern Israel, the Negev, with southern Jordan. This is what we didn't expect, working there. So when we start looking at Petra, I didn't realize at the time I was in the perfect place to really have an impact um, on this because I was working in a dead year. There was hardly, and no one in their right mind goes and works in Petra between May, June, July, and August, right? When you hear the Petras yelling, I'm seen, it's 50 degrees outside, they look at you like you're crazy. Who's working in 110, 115 degrees? I loved it, and my students had to like it. They had no choice. Um, but most tourists go there during the spring seasons and the fall seasons when it's really quite pleasant. It's really nice. And so we would go there during the summer. We didn't see many tourists then. Now it's a whole different, a whole different game. And nothing did it more than Harrison Ford. How did I get hooked? People always ask me, how did I get hooked on Petra? I was there in 1989. 
with friends, but they weren't with me when I was in Petra. And Petra was kind of out of the way. You didn't need to pay to go in in 1989. And I met a couple people, and they asked me what I did for a living. And of course, I'm a student. I said, I do nothing for a living. I just read books and all this stuff. What kind of things you read? And I told them, and they said, oh my god, we need a UNESCO rep in Petra for a day. We'll pay you, I think it was 40 bucks. We'll pay you 40 bucks, 1989. I said, OK, this sounds like fun. I'll do it. It's money. I don't care. I'm a grad student. Well, it turned out to be the guy watching that they didn't, monitoring that they didn't screw up the treasury during the filming of The Last Crusade. So I got to meet Queen Noor at the time, who stood behind the camera with me. I got to meet Harrison Ford, who thought I delivered water. And I, and I got to meet, I got to meet um, Sean Connery, who I didn't quite understand at the time. right? And then I ended up marrying a Scot, who is th whose accent is thicker than Sean Connery. So I got what I deserved. But that, that got me hooked. And this is just some of the films that they've been filming in Petra since I've been working there. And what's great is we've been involved as extras or on the scene or behind the scenes for a number of these films. Because they often film during the summer when there's not many tourists around. right? So it's easier for them. So this is some of the base, best data we could get from the Department of Antiquities, and it shows you how tourism has changed. So I first go to Petra here, and you can see we're looking at about 110 or 120,000 people for the whole year. And again, they're all within six months. They're not, going, they're not working during the rest of the year. Then the Gulf War hits and the second intifada in Palestine, and you can see that low, drops everything. We lucked out that we were, happened to be working there. This is the middle of my three-year Fulbright that we were there on this day in April when we hit 4,000 tourists in one day. Now, it doesn't sound too bad until I remind all of us that then that meant three bathrooms. <laughs> so you do the math, right? The lines were huge. Better when kids were making great money by telling the people in line they had to pay to use the toilet. And I, couldn't, I could not do anything but laugh. Right, because these kids are making 50 cents and a dinar here and there, telling people they had to pay to use the toilet. And these are just tourists just standing in line to use the bathroom. It was a mess. It was a nightmare. That day in April was horrible because we happened to hit that many tourists, and it was April. It's coming towards the end of the big busy season. And we happened to be, I happened to be there for three years at this time. So it got, then Iraq war hits, and look at, they also plummet again below, below about a quarter of a million. And then, of course, it lo slowly goes up again, keeps rising. And then this begins to happen with un unrest in the Middle East. And then COVID hits, and it plummets. The Jordanian government is now shooting for a 2 million per annum tourism base. And Petra is, at its greatest extent, about four or five miles. So you do the math. One of our master stu master's students who's now the st a statistician for the Census Bureau, believe it or not, he liked his numbers, did his master's, oh no, and his PhD, he did his on um, like figuring out a method to look at touristic numbers in Petra, and he mapped how many people were where at any time during the day throughout about a month. And it was great because it warned the Jordanians that you guys have to fix bathrooms, you've got to mm -hmm. fix things because we, the tourism that you used to you used to not be able to get it to get into the park till 8 30 or so and so Mohammed the student who was from Louisiana from New Jersey um, New Orleans um, mapped the tourists throughout the month at where they were during the day throughout the whole day from about eight in the morning till about seven at night and created these amazing maps that show the the whole plume of touristic numbers going in and out of the valley, the Jordanians were thrilled, right? They were so happy that he did this, you know, not free, I mean, as a college student for research, but his work turned out to be fantastic. But he was also, because of his work, he was a number cruncher, and that's why he now works for the census department. <laughs> and he's a good guy. I mean, I, but I love his name, Mohammed Salem. The, the alarms went off every time we went in and out of the country. Right? And then he would open his mouth and he sounded like a Cajun. Right? Because he was a second generation American from Palestinian parents. All right. So, why Petra? 
So we have a little bit of context, but I want to go backwards and explain why is it so easy and so fun to work there. It's because sandstone is a very common building material, right? And Petra represents this perfect laboratory to study deterioration of rock, cultural heritage management, and touristic studies. So we've milked it over the years, and we're still, we still have a lot of work to do. And the obvious things is like this down below is, you know, the structures, we love working in Petra because the rocks haven't been moved. These buildings that were carved 2,000 years ago, no one picked up and fiddled with. And restoration is almost zero. The Jordanians have not done very much trying to restore the buildings, so that was exciting to us. And the geology and lithology that had been studied in Petra goes back to the Germans into the 1920s. So we didn't have to worry about redoing analyses um, on some of this stuff. And that's a close-up of what it looks like when we go deep down. Those of you that are kind of geologic nerds um, in the group should also understand that you're not looking at um, colors that are related to how the rock formed. These are unrelated to how it formed. The lower part of Petra is fluvial, it's riverine, and it's also dunal, sand dunes. And those colors that you see is a very complicated process that over 500 plus million years, the metals in the sandstone have square danced and accreted. So the yellows are often sodiums, the reds are often <coughs> iron, the blues are a mixture of manganese and other things. And so what you're looking at is what used to be an evenly distributed kind of rock over time becomes colored where these different metals kind of want to be with like metals. Right? And so you get these spectacular colors that I've never, I mean, I studied a lot. I went to school in Arizona and in Reno and Nevada, and I've never seen sandstone that is this spectacular. And so the two rocks that we're talking about in Petra are very old. So we're looking at, these are the oldest sandstones exposed on Earth at 500 to 540 million years old. So the one that's really pretty and orangey, red, yellow, bright is the Umishreen, and the one above it is called the DC that looks kind of like vanilla ice cream. Um, at the turn of the century, an Italian chef cooking for a, a British expedition described Petra's sandstone as a lovely salmon mousse with a mustard sauce followed by the perfect chocolate souffle. And those colors are spot on. It's exactly how you see it. We're looking at the inside of the urn tomb, one of my students looking quite epic. Um, but the colors are different in here because during the winters, in the old days, they would use these for living spaces, and they're covered with iron scale, right? Um, fire scale from building fires. This is the inside. This is currently closed to tourists. This is called the Tomb of Colors. Um, it's this spectacular. For scale, those, are, those little alcoves are sarcophagi, right, for pl placing a coffin, to give you an idea for scale. Um, but this is especially spectacular, and we were involved with this on a number of occasions. We photographed tourists with screwdrivers um, hammering pieces of the rock for their purse. And so because of that, we were pretty appalled. And of course, we got stink eye, you know, for taking pictures. We got in trouble by the tourists and the tour guides. And so the Jordanians, rather than deal with it, I think in a better, better more efficient way, just closed it. It's, now, it's currently closed. You might be able to visit it with a tour guide specifically, but you'd have to pay extra because they want to make sure you're not going to pick at this rock anymore. So I'm going to talk about four of the research thrusts that we've had over the years quickly. So one of them is we looked at deterioration and recession. One of them is human-induced, you know, how do we mess up the humidity inside. One of them is architectural urban earth-sun relationship. And the newest one we're de dealing with is an epic catastrophic flood that we think occurred in the fourth to fifth century that changed Petra's um, history for a bit. So I want to back up a little bit, though, and explain to you that when I started to work there in the 1990s, there were no fancy hotels outside of Petra. There was a building called the Guest House that was kind of a dump that had to, that had to be renovated, which it was. And so for the first four or five years in Petra, I lived with the Bedouins, or I lived in a place called Nizal's Camp. So I ended, I ended up, I have great photographs of the old Bedouins, and a lot of our work now in Wadi Rum is identifying indigenous place names in the region from the old Bedouin groups down there. And I love, these guys are just lovely. And so I wanted to show you a couple pictures. This guy is making Bedouin bourbon, which is tea, super sweet. 
Um, a little tiny glass of tea holds about three sugar cubes. Um, three sugar cubes um, and a really strong black tea. And you drink it as hot as you can and during the hottest weather and you feel fantastic. You feel great, it actually works. But this is a tent that I lived in for a while that his family owned and it was lovely. It was like being home, I had a great time. Then, then this is one of the locals named Gassim who has actually recorded oud, a couple oud pieces. But, but Gassim is famous for something else. Um, he's famous for two camels, Alia and Alian, who are famous for knowing how to drink a Pepsi from a bottle by tipping their heads back or drinking from a water bottle. And Alian, this is Alian, who is really sweet. Alian learned how to kiss people. And it learned how to make kissy noises. It didn't just learn how to kiss you, it learned how to go. <laughs> and so he's doing this for me on the camera. And that's his buddy Hussein behind, who I lived with them one summer as well. And so these are the local Badul, which are the, the, the stewards of Petra that go back thousands of years. Now, when I didn't live with them, then we were moved into Nazal's camp. This is an old postcard from the 1930s of Nizal's camp, the oasis of comfort in the wilderness. So they were canvas tents, very much like the old days of Abercrombie and Fitch, right in here. But this was the dump most of us lived in, and that's exactly what it looked like. It was a couple of little uh, monastic cells, and my room, I lucked out, I had that room there because it had two windows and not one. The exciting thing about that room, and it took a lot of research to find out, is that is the room where Agatha Christie lived when she wrote Appointment with Death. <laughs> that was my cheap thrill for a whole summer. I was in heaven. The building is miserable. It's stone, it's hot, and at night, the temperature didn't drop between 80 or 85 until maybe 6 in the morning, and then I, it was miserable. The best thing about this building, though, you can't see in this picture, there's a little cliff right here, and you would walk across to the roof, and we'd sleep on the roof. And then the Bedouins would pull out you know, wood and build a fire. And they, I did terrible things to them over the years in wrecking the prime directive by introducing both peanut butter and marshmallows. Because <laughs> I lived, especially during Ramadan, I would live on peanut butter and steal a little peanut, peanut butter just for you know, protein and stuff. The problem was later they'd come up to me and they'd sniff my breath and they'd say, Bon Sudan, I smell peanuts. And it was Ramadan, I felt terrible, right? Because there's no water, they're not eating. It's summer, the days are long and I'm sneaking peanut butter. Um, but marshmallows were a big hit, especially when they realized not only were they yummy, but you could light it on fire and throw it. <laughs> and so we discovered comets right out of, out of marshmallows. It was fun, but this was not a fun place to live. But it was, the social aspect was fun, the physical aspect was miserable. But I love it. It's an oasis of comfort in the wilderness. This is from 1952, and it's a photograph of Nazal's camp. It's pretty tough. Right? We love these old photographs because we like to look at landscape change right? over time. Then this happened. In the mid-1990s, they started to upgrade hotels. This is the guest house that we would stay in if we were only there for weeks at a time. But again, if we're there for months at a time, we couldn't afford any of these places. Right? Then, this is the beginning. Then the Moven Pick opened in 1996 with a $28, $30 breakfast. Right? And my grad students just went nuts. So every so often we would talk one of the Bedouins that worked in the Moven Pick to sneak us in and get us muesli or something, right? Because it's a Swiss hotel. It was lovely. And then the Marriott comes in in 1999, and that's the beginning of everything. And the Mar Marriott's lovely. It's not proper in town. You have to take a bus to get to the entrance, but this is the view at night. So the problem is we're often on grant budgets over the years. What's interesting about this picture is a friend of mine that is a, photo a, pers a professional photographer came to Petra for a week and took pictures of us, and it's the very first summer I ever wore shorts. Because I've never worn shorts in Petra with the Bedouin. It's not a really acceptable way. The problem is that summer the Bedouins were also wearing shorts. It was a very hot summer, and everybody said, screw it, we're all wearing shorts. And so it's odd. And the following pictures, the only ones I could find, because this friend of mine, Danusha, took a number of these photographs, um, uh, were in shorts. And it's rare for me to think of myself wearing shorts. Um, so what happens is we couldn't afford the big hotels, the expensive hotels. But the hotels often made us deals that if we paid a couple dinars or, or were drinking gin and tonics, we could use the swimming pool or order dinner. 
So we discovered gin and tonics and pizza by the swimming pool in the Movenpick or the Intercon or the Marriott. And that made my students, um, it kept them from mutiny, <laughs> right? And so that kept us. This is one of the photographs we have from the trip. And I, it gets me very excited because I look at these guys and from Petra, red shirt, PhD, blue shirt, PhD, yellow shirt, masters. Yeah, and I look at that. And the blue shirt woman, we're currently trying to push towards a nomination in the Explorers Club as a fellow. She's really quite dynamic. She did her PhD with me. She's lived in Jordan for a number of years off and on. And she is one of the leading rock art and petroglyph specialists on Earth, especially in the Middle East. It's quite important. And I'll be working with her in May. Mike Weirich, Michael Weirich and I will meet her um, in a couple of months in Wadi Rum because she'll be working with us. But I could not pass up these guys. So this is little Muhammad. He was one of my helpers for a number of summers when he was little. Then he got older. They discovered girls or something, and I don't see them anymore. But I love this photograph because he's so happy because a goat, I put my hat down. These were the old felt hats, right? Because you can get them wet, and they cool you off your head. It's not a real fedora. It's just an old kind of felt hat. But I put my hat down to let it dry out a little bit from the sweat, and a goat started to eat the brim. And you can see the goat bite out of the hat, and I told Muhammad he could have it. And so this photograph of little Muhammad, my helper, he's delighted because he's got a cool hat. And of course, right away, he said, I am a cowboy. So this hat to him was cowboy, cowboy. All right. So back to the theater, this is some basic stuff. So my first work in 1990 was to work on the Roman theater. I studied and developed using random sampling, 14,000 points. It's the largest sandstone weathering data set that we know. And it, it turned out to be quite, I'm not gonna show you any more graphs in general, but it showed us some really important relationships between mm -hmm recession of rock and sun and recession of rock and the amount of iron in the matrix, right? Sandstone is both a sand grain and a glue. The glue is the matrix and the sand grain is a clast. And so we ended up hitting the jackpot because we realized the amount of iron in the glue is what determined how quickly the rock deteriorated. So when we got up to 4%, the rock showed no deterioration in 2,000 years. The problem is, is we realize though that the industry of conservation of rock and stuff needed recession rates. And we came up with the Roman theater alone. That theater came up with, we get some great data because we're looking at 14,000 points, 10 to 20 millimeters of recession every thousand years on vertical surfaces and 30 to 70, every thousand years on horizontal. This is a very big deal in the industry, right? For them to be able to determine, predict what, um, what was gonna happen. We also became fascinated with this. These are called tifoni. Tifoni, where they're called stone lace, they're called honeycomb, they're all over Petra and we didn't know much about it. So the standard book um, on earth surface processes is a large treatise on what is called geomorphology, the study of landforms, and the chapters on tifoni and these kind of rock weathering features are mine. And I have to thank Petra for all of this research. We did a ton of research on this. How did we do it? We measured 2,500 Tifoni features over the years and used a digital measuring equipment and laser measuring tools to develop, study both the dimensions and the volumes of these. And we, got, we came up with some pretty cool stuff that people are actually <coughs> interested in, right? Not just, and this is just another base, oh, I lied, I'm sorry. There's still another graph. And this, is, this shows you the, the relationship between dimension and you can see what we're looking at. We're looking at aspect, north, south, north. And we found out this odd thing is happening in Petra that the weathering occurs most on west and east faces and not on south that we had predicted. The north, we understand why, because the north is relatively wet with no sun and the lichens indurate the rock. They keep the rock from weathering. And it's a kind of a lichen. Some lichens actually accelerate weathering, and some lichens actually armor it. And these lichens, like Anora, this type of lichen, actually armors it. And so this was a big deal because this led to a whole nother bunch of papers that we realize it's not sun or wet or 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 that breaks down sandstone, but the number of cycles of wetting and drying, not the heat involved. 
So wetting and drying and rarely freezing and thawing. It's those cycles that occur that cause the rock to break down, not the extreme temperature or the wetter, wetter um, settings. And so then we get to this point, <laughs> analyzing rocks is only a small part of what we're facing. That's the monastery right there. There you can see scale. Can you see this? Look, see the person standing in the doorway for scale. And we realized this was a new gateway to research. So between 1998 and 2010, we started to measure the effect of tourists on the humidity inside the tombs. And we didn't even come close to uncovering anything. We hit the jackpot. These were significant relationships. Now, what happened is very different, though. So the treasury is not the largest of the tomb chambers. You can see it's 2,000 square me cubic meters. The urn tomb right there is indeed the largest. It's almost twice the size inside. So we started to look at the number of tourists. Short of holding um, humidity meters in front of their mouths, um, we would count the number of tourists that came in. Um, Kaylin, who you saw earlier, we actually tried to calculate mass, like the total weight. We realized, no, we're going to get in trouble there. And so, um, but we looked at the number of people in relationship to these tomb sizes. There's the inside of the urn tomb. We're going to see in a minute again. And look what we found. It became really obvious that more than 20 or 30 tourists in both chambers caused the humidity inside to jump at least 20%, if not more. <laughs> The literature, the science on humidity changes causing deterioration of architecture is huge. It's huge. And who is using this research to make a point that was delight, that they were delighted were the Egyptians dealing with the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens. And so that's why, I hate to say this, this is why the Khazne, the treasury, is currently closed because the Jordanians didn't want to have to regulate the number of tourists, so they just closed it. You can walk up to the stairs, but you can no longer go inside, and they blame us for it. Our argument was put in fans that are solar, solar driven, and they didn't want to do it. So the same thing is happening in the Valley of the Kings. They're using this research. They're using our methodology to study the same thing in the Valley of the Kings, King Tut stuff, and Valley of Queens. And so we're, they're counting the number of tourists, trying to estimate mass. I think the Egyptians are better than I am at guessing weights um, because they actually have mass data. I'm not sure about that. Um, but looking at it in terms of chamber volume. And so we looked at not only what the tourists were doing to these inside spaces, we wanted to see what was going on. And this is why the Khazne is also closed. And it's this guy right here. This started it all. So see him touching the wall. It's not a big deal. Com it's very common. This guy's sitting on a bench. This guy has parked his butt along the wall. We consider this the, the butox zone. We've joked about the buttocks area because everybody leans against the tombs at that same place. You're going to see what happens. This was weird because we noticed in the same place, people are sweating. They're tired, they, and they always put their hands in the wall. And so what we saw was what we thought was white efflorescence. We thought the rock was weeping salt, right? So, which is common with sandstone. When we had it tested, the primary ingredient was stearic acid. So I had to ask people, stearic acid, what the hell? Isn't stearic acid related to beef? And they said, yes, it's the primary ingredient in what? Suntan oil. And so what people were leaving all over the tombs was sunblock and suntan oil. And the cheaper stuff, the good stuff you pay for doesn't have stearic acid in it, but uh, you can't believe how much does. So that T-bone you had and you cut off the fat to give to the dogs, you could have sold it to Coppertone for their, you know, for their, their suntan lotion. So this was also part of a report, a white paper we wrote, and again, what the Jordanians did was they closed it. They didn't put up signs. We said, put up cordons. Put up a cordon and say you can't, you know, keep a meter away that they can't reach the walls. They didn't. And so, and it, the other thing I want you to see in this picture, guess what that is, right? Wow. It's tourist shishi. So one of my dear students over the years, it's become a very good friend of mine, would get down on their hands and knees and collect urine samples from the sandstone. Oh. 
And these are tourists that they wait till the tour guide turns around, have a quick whiz in the tomb, and get out. It's awful. So we decided to look at the wall of the butt right here. This is the wall where everybody, that man's butt was right here, that man was touching right here, but this is where everybody parked their ass on the wall, right? So we decided to look at that and we, we pulled out laser measuring devices and we looked at this wall. We went back 40 or 50 years because it's covered with graffiti that is indicating that just about post-war, about 1960. And that wall right there, that square you're looking at, has lost seven square meters of material in the last 50 years. And we had to convert this for all of us who live at Home Depot, that that equals seven of those big orange buckets that we use in the garden, right? This is some of the laser work that we did. And you can see these are isolines that represent the recession. This would be zero recession, and there's a zero line right there. That's 10 down, these are in millimeters, that's one centimeter decrease, and it goes all the way down. Look, here's 40, and here's 60 and 50. So it went down 50 is five centimeters, which is two inches of deterioration in just a couple of years. And I always love to remark that our ward and Christina were, were awful enough to carve their names directly into the sandstone. And this was a wall dressed by the Nabataeans 2,000 years ago. The other thing that always gets me excited, because I get in contact with a lot of these guys, I've done work with the Laysan Buddha in China, sandstone, Valley of the Kings and Queens, sandstone, Mesa Verde, sandstone, and Angkor Wat. And so these are all related to our work in Petra, because the material is quite similar. And so Angkor Wat, a lot of work is being done on the deterioration of sandstone using some of our findings and then they send it back to me, right? For me to like pipe up or do whatever we're talking about. Then what happens is after we're looking at deterioration, we notice something, I mean, I've worked there for so long that you have all these hunches. And we noticed these are in a really difficult place to get to. Um, this is the high place of sacrifice up here. This is, most tourists don't go up here. You can see there's no one in the picture. But notice right here, there's two obelisks. One's kind of chubby and one's kind of slender. Those obelisks aren't constructed. They were hewn from a mountaintop. So those were, every, all the rock around it, see the peak was right here, was carved down to expose just those two obelisks. We thought this was odd because we always have Bruntons and digital equipment and GPS and all this stuff in our work. And we noticed that these, these weren't arbitrary on a peak. There you can get a better view. Here we're seeing the lined up, and we started to do work, and we found out they are exactly rib to rib, zero, zero, zero alignment. They are exactly east and west. Not kind of, sort of, right? I think we'd be off a couple degrees if you and I had to do this. And they're carving the mountain down to g expose <coughs> these obelisks. So east to west. If you, if you look at old historic literature or even 19th century books like The Golden Bough or all these things, right, the concept of four seasons during the year is relatively modern, right? So early people looked at the earth as having, as the earth having two halves, a growing half, a light half, and a dark half or a not growing half. So east and west marks the beginning of the dark and the beginning of the light. So this begins to give us an idea that that we knew that Nab the Nabataeans were agriculturally focused because this would be like, oh my God, they're lined up. Okay, let's start planting. Or they're lined up now. The sun is going into equinox. Let's just take it easy for six months. Let's prep for planting, but we can't plant yet. But this still haunted us. And so when you live there and you're walking around, there are whole days that get so hot you don't want to do anything, right? And so we also noticed oddballs like this. So this is the... So a number of the tombs, there's the palace tomb and the Corinthian tomb. But we noticed these, this weird doorway that shouldn't be there. When you take all the time to design this building, there's a proper doorway with a rounded pediment. Here's another doorway with a reverse pediment. There's a doorway that makes sense. There was probably no doorway here that we can tell, we're not sure. But what the hell is this doing here? And what are those? So we started to do, I mean, this is when I love that students follow passion, right? So I have a hunch. Let's do it. And we had a hunch. We started to measure 
countless number of tomb, tomb interiors. And we found out something bizarre, that those little keyholes that you see on the outside of the building, the Corinthian tomb, line up to a glyptic of the sun back here and a glyptic of the sun or a rose or something like that over here. And this is the winter solstice sunset and this is the equinox sunset. So we realized, well, wait a minute. Maybe the Nabataeans were may, way more keyed and, and understanding of Earth-Sun relationships on what we call marker days, sun solstice and equinox. And oh my God, some of the cases were okay and some of the cases like this was just weird. I don't know what the hell's going on here. There's a glyptic in the corner. This is, I don't know what this means. And we would find, we did these to all over Petra. Here's a keyhole here. And okay, all right, there's an equinox sunrise in the middle niche. And here's one, okay, that's kind of cool. All right, that's nice. We just spent two days measuring this tomb and this is what we found. And then all of a sudden, that's the garden tomb, what it looks like. That's the building you're looking at right here with the weirdo, with the strange alignment. But I wrote about this um, years and years ago in the early 90s that I thought it was odd that of all the tombs in Petra, the urn tomb is facing exactly west. And it's exactly. And it looks like the building was kind of jury rigged as they were building it and kind of fiddled with it to kind of keep making it wonky until it had this exact face. We thought this was odd. This doesn't make sense. And I just thought it was just an oddity, you know, or just something accidental. And so this is the inside again of the urn tomb and this is what we found that shocked us. We found out that on the equinox the sun shines directly through the middle door and the door above it like a letter slot and shines directly to a little knob in the back. And on the winter solstice sunset it shines directly across to the edge where there's a glyptic and it shines directly across to this side to the opposite. So this tomb, see how it's not quite, it's not quite ortho, and we realize, oh my God, this was intentionally modified for, as a calendar or a clock. And this is what you would see from the door of the urn tomb. This is how the sun would shine in. It not only had very specific orientation to the inside. Look at how the sun actually dropped over remarkable peaks in valley in the valley. This was so exciting to us when we found this out because the Nabataeans were always considered inferior to the Romans in their engineering skills. And now we realize, oh no, no, the Romans learned from the Nabataeans. Here's the inside of the tomb. There's the, a light, a modified, it's fake. I mean, we put this in, but there's the summer solstice, there's the equinox, and there's the winter solstice. And that's how it would shine through the building. Then, after 20 years of research in Petra and a lot of hunches, I come from a French and Italian family and we live on hunches, right? <laughs> right? You know how it goes, right? And so something was, something was going on. So during one of my summers, I'm walking down the street and we all had walkie-talkies before we really had good phones. And the archaeological groups always had my phone because I was their free geologist and cartographer and geographer on the trip, right? And so something was going on one day and one of the guys said, I don't know what's going on, but this it was, this right here was Petra's shopping mall, right here, all the way down. The great temple you just saw before is there and the church is right here to give you an idea. Um, and so what happened was one of them called me up, this big Fiema, who's at the University of Finland now, called me up and said, I don't know what the hell's going on, but we are excavating nothing but sand in one of the tombs and it's right in the middle of all the living spaces the sh shop and so here we are in this picture and that is the area right there that he said i don't understand what's going on we have coins here we have coins here they're literally only a couple years apart and they were removing the whole bulk wall of all the material because it didn't have anything juicy in it and i said don't Smithsonian did a whole series, if you've seen it, Smithsonian did a series on this with me. And so I said, don't remove this up. These are classic flood sediments and they have a very distinctive lamination. We can look at this, these are floods. 
So he said, floods, we don't get floods in Petra. And I said, what are you, crazy? We get floods all the time in Petra. And this is what it looks like when they're bad in this picture here. And that's not a major flood. That's just a wet, a really bad storm. And then you go back in time. And in the 19, 1960s, a number of French tourists were killed in Petra when a flash flood hit them in the Sikh. And they were not just killed in the Sikh. Their bodies were washed all the way down to the treasury. So this was a really ugly setting where they found a number of bodies in a heap at the treasury. right? And so, no, this happens. Now, Petra, with the Romans, had created, so Petra is, Petra, the Romans um, create it as an annex state. They don't conquer anything. Under Trajan, they make it an annex, right? Like a client status, like corporate takeover. And all the Romans did say, use our money, right? And you don't have to adopt our language except in law. And then you can then trade within the commerce of the empire. And so the Nabataeans and the Romans become famous friends at the time. And, and Nabataean and Petra especially then goes through a whole new life. Right? And so the Romans built little dams all over, but a number of earthquakes in the third, fifth, and sixth century, we think removed all those dams. And so the late Nabataeans by the fifth century had no protection from fat flash floods. So with the flood we think that occurred somewhere between the fourth and fifth century because we have coinage up above and below. Right? Now this turned out to be a very big deal the more we dug because we noticed there are whole pavers missing on the main street in Petra that are missing in very distinctive shapes. These are limestone pavers. They're about a foot deep. And there's whole areas where they're missing and then whole areas where they're intact. When you look at them from satellite images, you realize those missing pavers represent large meanders of a flood event. So we looked at flood sediments all over the valley and we got up to six or seven meters on the far side of the main road. So the Tetra Church is right here. The Great Temple is right here. To give you an idea, the theater is behind us. So it came through a side door into Petra that had used to have Roman, Roman weirs and dams, and they were all destroyed in a flood. So we think by the fifth century hits, we have a catastrophic event that we now consider a one in a thousand or one in 2,000 year event. And Petra was inundated by 20 feet of water. So what's interesting to me that I learned out of this is I had a number of historians at conferences say, we have no record of the flood. And at first I would listen and go, okay, I, I understand, I appreciate that. And then after a while I said, you know, I hate to tell you this, but sometimes I think science wins, right? So we have one man's record, one person's record that doesn't mention a flood means no flood has ever occurred. And so it made me stauncher in research in the area. And the more work we did, the more we said, these are flood sediments and there's no question about it. We also went back to a number of paleo hydrologists that looked at this and they said, why are you even questioning your own research? This is stupid. This is so obvious to me. And then that's when I realized, okay, shut up. Someone didn't write about it, doesn't mean it didn't happen. And so what we think happened was this flood event of 20 feet would have slowed the city down for literally a couple of weeks you know, it slowed it down, and then Petra was back to work, right? So, of course, now I'm totally comfortable, comfortable the flood has occurred, and we've had hydrologists now come to Petra and look at our work, and they're even coming up with deeper flood events, more epic flooding, which makes me happy. So these are some of the things we just talked to. There's the Byzantine church, there's the royal tomb, the Sikh, the theater, and the great temple. And that would have been the lowest extent of the flood. If you notice that the pavers are missing on the Grand Plaza of the Great Temple, so the argument is the flood easily got to that high and it's part of a me meander. Now, if you look at it from a different angle lower down, it looks like this. And this is when you realize that downtown was wiped out. And those are all the malls. Those are the, the shops right here. See the little colonnade right in here? Those were all the shops that were filled with that sediment that you saw me pointing at. So we're really quite excited about this. So there's also been a lot of cartography we've done. I'll go through these quickly just to show you what we've done over the years in Petra, mostly for the Kingdom of Jordan. 
and of course our publications. We've done thematic maps for a number of books. The Queen of Petra is a, is a, a, a British um, historian named Jane Taylor. Her books are by far above and beyond everyone else's. Um, she, was, she lived in Jordan for years. She was the royal historian under Queen Noor, and her books are the best. Uh, Jane, Jane Taylor often got us from the very beginning to do our mapping, and these are some of the maps for Jane Taylor. This was, this is 2016, but we did our first maps for Jane Taylor probably in 1995. Then we've also done a number of maps for television product, projects. These are a number. This one is very exciting because we went all over Petra and identified natural springs, cisterns, dams, and weirs, and tombs. So that was fun to do maps for, I don't even know who this went to. Discovery Channel, Nat Geo, I don't know, Smithsonian, I give up sometimes. And then we've done digital elevation models, right, that are really quite accurate using satellite imagery and ground truthing. And so here's one right here that shows the Cosne. This is a DEM here of sorts. And this is one using satellite imagery to also confirm the two. And these are the first of them of their kind um, that are this accurate and this good. And then we've done a number of composite maps like this that have shaded relief and colors and pretty things and tombs and all these different identification, these kind of things. So we've done a number of these over the years for books, for TV, for all kinds of stuff that I've done. This was also excited. Um, we, were, we worked with a number of television companies to try and reconstruct Petra. We're still not done, we have a long way to go. So what you're looking at is the early string work, um, line work that's used in 3D modeling like AutoCAD and different things like that. And you can see when it's reconstructed, and this is coarse, this is early on. We're still trying to get this done right and done better. And so this gives you an idea. What are you looking at in this picture? That is the great temple of Amon, of Petra, sorry. And the Synthronon is inside this room. So when you had a gripe with the mayor, as you went through the big door, you had to stand at the bottom of the little theater and all the city council members, right, pass judgment on you in that little room. And so that's the Grand Plaza right there and the flood, had there's indications that the flood got this high and ripped out all those pavers. And most of these pavers are between six inches and a foot thick. So this flood was pretty, pretty, pretty catastrophic. Then this happened in my life that, you know, just when you think you're getting old, you wanna retire and stuff like this happens, I get a call from the most lovely people in the world and they said, if you had um, a sugar daddy and an unlimited blank check, what would you do in Petra? Because I, you know, I remember them saying, I said, how many specials have we seen on Petra? And I said, oh, okay, okay. And my wife's trying to figure out what the phone call's about. And I said, I do, I do, right? And I said, we, I, we have a theory that is pretty well confirmed now that the architecture in Petra was carved from the top down. So see these two temples, these two, sorry, these facades, these are probably tombs that they're both contemporary and you can see what's going on. One is kind of finished and beat up and the other one hasn't been finished. So they said, what do you do? What are you doing? And I said, let's reconstruct a tomb from Petra using the original Roman tools from 2,000 years ago. And our sugar daddy, who was a large producer in Southern California, said, you're on. I love this idea. You're, you're dumb enough to do it. And I said, I am. I said, I don't even want to think of how hard this is going to be. And it turned out to be almost a year and a half project. And it was so much fun. My students have no idea that every weekend of my life, for about three or four months, I was gone because I'll tell you where I got to go. But my tan got better and better and better. So we looked at sandstone that was like Petra, and we were not allowed to do something like this in Jordan because the paperwork alone was going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars for us to initiate research. Then, of course, I'm looking at my sandstone, right, right, my stuff, and I said, oh my God, the American Southwest. Well, the good stuff is on national park lands. And the National Park Service laughed at me. They said, oh yeah, right, really? We're gonna let you carve one of our faces in the Wingate sandstone. So we kept looking around, and then one of my friends said, let's look at the Native American councils, right? Big fights, because some of the councils said, yes, we'll do it, and some of the councils said, you're not digging up, you're not gonna cut on sacred lands. So 
So we thought, what the hell are we gonna do? The sugar daddy said, I happen to own 4,000 acres above a major city in Southern California. Can you find anything there? Well, we lucked out. This is when there is a guardian angel because the more research we did, we did find out, see these little mustard colored patches up here? It's a sandstone, it, nothing is as old as Petra. So we realized we couldn't go with age, but we could go with lithology and similarities. And he said, you can do whatever you want because I own all that land and you can stay in one of my mansions. <laughs> um, the best thing was, so every weekend for four months or so, I flew out, there's direct flights from Arkansas to LA because of Walmart and Tyson, and you know, there's big money out there in Northwest Arkansas. And on Thursday night, I would take the fly out, flight out, it'd get into Petra, sorry, my Petra. <laughs> I'd get into LAX about six or seven, rent the car, and either drive up to Santa Barbara, which you can see this is where we are, there's Goleta, and um, we did the work first on looking for the right sandstone. It took us a while. And we did the petrology. We had to do all the rock science stuff. And this is what we were looking at in this property. These are his mansions. Oops. Well, those are his mansions behind us on the hill. And so what we did was, this is a guy that's a friend of a friend. He's a sandstone sculptor, quite important. If you're ever in Santa Barbara, he did the large relief that's sitting at City Hall in front. So he's really quite remarkable. And then we hunted down another friend of a friend who's a stonemason from, stone from London. So I had this team of me and these two guys and we ended up with that face. And it was perfect. The film, the film crew liked it as well because the lighting was good, right? It's, everything about this was great. But we had to say the site was undisclosed, right? It was secret. The owner wanted us to. But everyone that saw this picture <laughs> says, is that University of California at Santa Barbara? <laughs> is that UCSB? And then the other one I love is, and I grew up in California, and then you go, wait a minute. That's Catalina. <laughs> I know where this is. You're not allowed up there, though, right? Because it's private property. The best thing it was, he was a very nice man. He's a, a book author. He writes mysteries. He's really quite famous on TV. And he also gave us, I hate to say this, gave us our own Abed. Abed is Arabic for slave. We had this wonderful, his nephew was this kid that got a, he, the kid got a, um, like a little Polaris, you know, motor, six wheel motorcycle thing. And the kid was with us the whole time and his job was to go on the Saturday and Sunday was to go into town and get us whatever we wanted to eat. And so at first we fought, felt guilty with this kid doing all the work and then we found out that his uncle bought him this motorcycle thing to do this for us. So we love this guy having him around. So we never had to worry about food, we didn't have to do anything. We just literally had to worry about what we were doing and then sunblock. And so we started carving. And what's weird about this, this is when someone was definitely looking over us. I don't know, right. We just thank Buddha and Allah and whoever the whole time like Petra, when you start to carve the rock, it begins to evaporate the moisture within the sand. Sandstone is, is permeable, right? And so it gives off water. So see the color? That color is just like Petra. That's the color of rock at Petra when it's freshly hewn. It's this lovely kind of dark rose kind of color. And very quickly it dries out within a couple of days. And those are the Roman tools. We were using Roman chisels um, all these different bolsters, all these different devices to duplicate what was done 2,000 years ago. And there we are, one of the rare photographs we have of us working, and there we're starting to carve the facade down and see how the color changed as it dried out. This is a, he's a Russian film guy, he was a hoot. Um, and by, as the cliche she goes, there was always a bottle of vodka somebody, somewhere nearby. <laughs> I loved, he was delightful. And so, and you can see the color, I get darker and darker over it. And the students started to figure out something was wrong. And so here we are carving it. What we ended up doing is we realized that after a couple of months, we were gonna be there for another two years. So we realized using Mel's little hammers and chisels was gonna get the work done, but it was gonna take us years. So we realized let's keep the same tools, but change the process of hammering and using an air compressor. So we used a compressor to, with a hammer head, to affect the chisels. So we cheated, but we had to, because otherwise I might still be there. And so we started to carve, and this is when I got scared. 
because I realize that one miss chisel is going to chip this off. So this is when I was beginning to get scared. But I want you to notice that the architecture of those capitals is uniquely Nabataean. No one does that weird style with that knob on it except in parts of Pegra, uh, Petra and Hegra in north, north, um, northwestern Saudi Arabia where the Nabataeans also had power. And there it is, almost finished, right? We have since carved a little theater set up with steps in the foreground, and I don't know what he uses it for, but it's on his <laughs> private property. So we, we hope he's burning a fire with nude people jumping over the fire pit for the soul stone or something, because we did something also with this tomb that we never got into the TV special. We ran out of time, and you're gonna see what that does. So this is Petra's Lost City of Stone, Nova, it premiered to 42 million, and we are currently at about 130 million viewers. It's still number one on PBS. So that's me doing my best job at directing what I've never really directed quite the same before. So what happens is I took part of it out of this, but part of that tomb is specifically arranged for so when the sun rises on the summer solstice, it shines directly into the tomb facade inside that and we ran out of time at 53 minutes for Nova so I decide here I'll put this is your these are your test questions right so what have we learned in Petra so far examining extrinsic versus intrinsic influences and in stone decay has proved to be a big deal and this is an old concept from the 20s and it's now coming back we have to look at the effect of climate and people on the mineralogy petrology the rock itself and it was kind of overlooked because it's obvious Environmental factors like sunlight play underrated roles in accelerating deteriorations through not the sunlight itself, but through accelerating or decreasing wetting and drying and freezing and thawing cycles. So the sun is changing the frequency of these cycles. That the effects of humans on stone decayed environmental degradation are grossly underestimated or overlooked. Duh. Right? Earth-Sun relationships may have played a greater role in classical period architecture and urban morphology than previously understood. We know a lot of people that do classical urban morphology, um, Roman, Greek, Hellenistic stuff that are beginning to look at solar alignments the same way and asking us how to do it, right? Because you hate to say this, but, and we have to deal with mutation. We have to deal with the change in sun angle over 2,000 years. So they're asking us to help them because Right, in general, historians aren't trained in Earth-Sun relation. You know, I mean, it's not a really big part of what they're trained to do, which is great, I'd love to help. And that conventional scientific analyses are often overlooked as supportive, collaborative, but sometimes contradictory. And we're getting a lot of people to say, well, can you prove this? And I said, no, you're talking to the wrong person because I should ask you, can you prove that historical record is not biased, is objective, in the same way I can at least explain to you how my facts and my data that I've collected are a little more objective to a certain extent, still biased, but it's a very different way of looking at things. And that totally turned my head around. When people said there's no proof that his, the Petra experienced a flood, so big deal. I went, okay, right, doesn't bother me. So what's ahead for Petra? And all I can think of is more years of work, not just mine, but students and other scholars that are willing to walk miles in and miles out to do their research. That's the UNESCO too, to give you an idea. And this guy who I love, this guy's name is Michael Jackson. Um, <laughs> little Muhammad, this was his donkey when he was little, but he did the cutest thing that I taught him. He would walk up to tourists with the donkey for a ride, five dinars for a long ride, and say, air conditioned four by four. <laughs> And he made money. That little kid would have 50 dinars, 70 bucks by the end of the day during school vacation by selling Michael Jackson rides. All right, if there are any questions, these are some of the funding agencies I've dealt with over the years. NSF, of course, USAID, USIS, and MERTP is no longer there. That was the National Middle Eastern Research and Training Program that was fantastic for teachers in America. And then ICOMOS, who I'm very active with, UNESCO, the Petra National Trust, U.S. Fulbright, J.C., King Fod Center at the University of Arkansas, PBS, Air, um, Arte France, and of course the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And I'm going to show you something that is super illegal. This is my last photograph. You're not allowed on these, right, in buildings. These are UNESCO World Heritage Sites. But my first year there in 1990, 
when my hair hadn't started to go gray yet. We snuck up the backside with Bedouins and they filmed me on the top of the monastery. And that's 1991. It's illegal. Now, we got in a fight with this because National Geographic's cover on the Petra article has a Bedouin sitting on the top. And we got involved with a very big fight, siding with UNESCO, because it was years after this, siding with UNESCO saying that's unacceptable, that you took a World Heritage site and on the cover of your magazine showed a guy that had just climbed up the front wrecking stuff with good tread shoes. So please, I'd love to talk to you about questions, answer questions. This is my home away from home for three decades. I realized I just spoke without the microphone. You should have said something. You should have yelled at me. I need an Italian mother in here to go. Please, Felix. He's walking around with the microphone. He's got the microphone. Uh, I'm sure the answer is no to this, but out of curiosity, because it is sandstone, did you ever encounter any canyoneers or rock climbers trying to like go up the canyon? Excellent question. Um, we caught a German guy rappelling down from the, to the top of the treasury years ago. And we didn't know what to do, because you could see the sandstone wearing off with his shoes as he's rappelling down the front. And we mentioned it to somebody. The Bedouins have had satellite phones before I knew what they were. You remember the big old ones that were really thick, like a carton of cigarettes? And one of the Bedouins called another Bedouin who called the desert guard, and the police came down, and sh they shot at him with a rifle. And then I yelled, because the shells are hitting the front of the treasury. So they're shooting at the building. They're trying to get the guy down. He says he doesn't speak English, which he did. Um, Repelling down the front. And so what we ended up doing was I said, shoot around him into the rock face that doesn't have an effect. And then we became scared because we think they were trying to shoot at the rappel rope. And we thought, great, this German guy's going to die falling from the building. But it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon. Um, and the more I've worked there, the more it's become a, a sacred place to me, right? That this is something we need to protect for our kids and our grandkids, everybody. And when these people are, the Roman theater is currently closed because of a comment I made in papers years ago that the 2,000 years of climate has not affected Petra as much as 20 years of tourist grippy shoes, right, of the better shoes that we wear when we, when we go in Petra. And so the, the Department of Antiquities guys called me up and they go, what are you talking about? And I said, well, I'm working in the theater. This is in the early days. So they closed the theater. So when you go to Petra, you can walk up and look in, but you cannot go in and climb around on the steps anymore. So these are not our recommendations, but this is how they, rec they react to what we have to say. But the gun with the rifle and shooting at the German repeller was almost funny until we realized you're wrecking the building and you might hit his rope and then he will fall 200 feet, right? So, but that's a great question because I think they want to. So they either have to do it out of, out of, after dark when we can't see it or something. There was, yeah. Follow-up question, because I was in Petra quite recently and noticed what looked like little pit marks or bullet marks in the facade of the treasury. Was that from, what was that from? Um, on the facade proper or on the side? Those big gouges on the side or the little holes in the front? Holes. The little holes in the front are, are, are shells from shooting because it was called the treasury because legend was that that urn at the top that's a solid piece of sandstone actually contained gold. So the old Bedouins used to shoot at it trying to get the gold coins to fall out. They weren't very good shots because the urn is wrecked but so are whole areas of the front of the Khazne. The, those big cavities on the side are a whole different controversy that I'm in the middle of because old timers Old historians talked about scaffolds, that the Nabataeans used scaffolds. Well, pollen analysis that we've, we've had done in Petra shows that there's never been an abundance of trees. And so scaffolding implies you have wood, right, or plastic from Home Depot, right? No, we don't see that. 
And so my argument is that we found, if you noticed our digging at the, at the last, the Petros, the PBS special, did you notice as we're carving, we're creating from the rubble the ramp that allows us to walk up to more carving. And so we realized when they're carved from top down, the rubble produced as you're carving down becomes the ramp that you can use to go up and continue carving, like Masada, right, in, in Israel has a very famous ramp. The Romans built to, to you know, attack the, the outpost. So uh, my argument, and we've done it, a number of TV shows on it, um, indicates that no, they did not use scaffolding. They had this brilliant technique, drilling holes into the face that were a certain depth using metal pipes, which we see around Petra, these odd, and they would use one piece of wood as a plank across. And as they carved down, they kept moving the holes and the plank with them until they had the ramp that allowed them to get up just from the debris of the material they were carving. So. Thank you. Um, in one of your reconstructions, you, you had palm trees. Was there an irrigation system in place? Oh my God, it was spectacular. So um, an archaeologist, his very good friend, Leanne Badal, is doing work on that place in Petra that's called the Paradisios. And we think it was a Vegas-like water garden. And it was a show, like in Vegas, right? That this is a desert, but who are you to tell us we can't blow water? And so Leanne's work indicates, uh, we've looked at the sediments, and I've done research with her, looking at these, depth, d these deep sediments that don't make sense in the middle of Petra up above. And we realized it was a water garden with palm trees in the middle. And so, I mean, you can imagine you're entering Petra. It's second century AD. You're walking through the valley. There's shops all over. You look up, and there's a waterfall with a fountain, a temple, and palm trees. And so not unlike Vegas, right? You know, the <laughs> idea of showing off. And the Nabataeans were that successful and that um, rich, we think. We still find jewelry um, all over Petra beautiful, spectacular Roman and gold amethyst pieces. And Peridot, we find from Zebrajet, from, from um, the Red Sea. So we're constantly finding that, so. Did Petra and Hegra decline pretty much at the same time? They did, that's a great question. Um, yes, there's a bunch of ways we can indicate. Jane Taylor, who I was talking about, has a book coming out right now on Al-Ula and the whole region of Saudi Arabia right there. Um, and we think the fall is similar. Some people argue that the fall is um, really, the fall becomes really, so fourth, fifth, and sixth century, we see Petra, it's thriving, but not very well. We think though the nail in the coffin occurs with the growth of Islam because the trade routes all change direction. And so the trade routes all move to the sea or to the east. And in doing so, Petra being crossroads um, to, for, to Basra, to the north in, in um, so the crossroads of Petra to the north would be Basra, which is current Syria. To the south, it would be go down to Sheba, right, to Hadramaut in, in um, what is now Yemen. And to the east, it would be what is now Kuwait City, that was the Roman city of Karax, where, where Trajan will die. Trajan will die in Kuwait City. And so those crossroads were really valuable until the crossroads change and the north-south road, the north-south road is redirected farther east under Islam. So we think that's the final, right, the final thing. But it's used, there are, there are crusader, there are four crusader castles in Petra. So we know that it was part of, right, the crusader work, right, and Saladin did a lot of his work in repelling and the taking of Jerusalem in Petra. It's one of their headquarters. Right. And so, I mean, it still is active in those 300 years of the Crusades, right? But it's not the rich power center like it is at this time that we're talking about. Hi there. When you were looking at the, uh, the hydraulic characteristics of the, the site and then wondering about the sediments and so on. I, I was wondering, do you have digital terrain models of the entire area? And were you able to do any CFD modeling? We of do. The, the um, our resolution's pretty good um, of the, the DEMs for all of Petra. The problem is that we've noticed that it moves. 
we've noticed that a lot of our data, either the data is weak from the beginning when we're triangulating either satellite imagery or ground stuff, but we also noticed that sediment train transport on slopes is really active in Petra. Right. But that's a good thing, because that kind of reinforces some of our theories that it's not a static dead place, mm -hmm. right, geologically or geographically or whatever. But increasingly, we want the Jordanians to take over what we're doing. So we've trained students over the years that'll work with us in the field, but we want them to just do it. You know, we just want them to, to get more and more active. And they used to blame it on money, but that's not an issue anymore. It's becoming increasingly inexpensive. Were you able to do any CFD modeling of the water flow? Um, actually, we have. Um, one of the scholars that we dug up for the PBS special is at San Jose State, and he's one of the paleohydrologists. And he came in, he's in the show, and he's the one that said um, that the angle of the drainage within Petra, so we've mapped all, I've mapped the cisterns, I've mapped the channels, I've mapped a bunch of this stuff. But he said what's amazing is that the Nabataeans modified their drainage canals to be within three to four degrees off of horizontal, which is a perfect slope to keep the water running easily without creating a hydraulic head backing up or moving slowly. And he said, this was, not, this was not arbitrary. This was intentional on the part of great engineering. And what's interesting is a lot of the hydraulic engineering we see in Petra pops up in the Roman Empire the following century. So we're beginning to think that the Nabataeans actually trained some of the Romans that come in with, Hagen, with Trajan by 106, 104 to 106 AD, that we start to see a lot of these aspects start to trade. The Roman theater is built under Vitruvian standards, yeah. right? Exactly. And so we know that the Romans before Trajan are already trading information with the Nabataeans. And of course, the Nabataeans are going to say, you know, we really appreciate this help, this is brilliant. However, have you thought of this? And so we see a lot of the technologies that we see in Petra pop up in Rome, in Roman regions, especially in areas that we now look at like Croatia, area Slovenia, areas on the edge of the empire. There we see engineering technologies similar to what the Nabataeans are popping up. And they're not popping up till the second and third century AD. Were those water systems No, that's good. Some of them, I think, were indeed wet that are draining some of the springs that are active. There's a number of springs in Petra. Um, but the really big, big, big ones are based on threshold cisterns that have to fill up all the way before the water channels down. There are cisterns. They're, they're all over Petra easily the size of this room, cisterns that big. And they're carved directly out of the rock. And so that water would fill up the cistern, and only when it received, got to a certain height would it then drain into a canal for another purpose, irrigation or drinking or whatever. They're all over. The cisterns worry us because every so often the Bedouin kids are found dead inside, right? They're not great swimmers. And so we've tried to work to mark all of the cisterns that we can find to somehow figure out a way to keep them out. The problem is they use the water themselves. Right, they lower ropes in, but they can lower to get the water, but the kid can build these rebar cages and stuff like this, but it's always sad. I bet nearly every summer that I've been there, I've heard of a little kid found dead in a cistern. And they're smart. They know that that water is off limits unless they can figure out when the kid died. You know, the first thing they do is ask the parents, when did the kid disappear? Oh, he's only been dead two days, the water's okay, right? But if he's been gone a while, they, they know, they're smart, they, they, that water is, Prohibited. Mam nua. It's no, 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 no one, right? It's an interesting culture. I love these guys. You can't, because it's all about practical. That's amazing. Um, I have a lot of students that are most fascinating about Muslim Islamic treatment of women. And I said, you may need to make a big, you need to make a distinction between Bedouin lifestyles as well and like urban Islam. Because the Bedouins, their wives are fundamental to their lives, their livelihood, and their safety. And so women are very, very active in Bedouin politics and Bedouin households, right? It's a very different thing than when I lived in Amman, and you'd go to someone's house for dinner, and you didn't know there was a woman cooking in the other room, and she was not allowed to come out. In a Bedouin household, the woman comes out and will sit with you and ask you how dinner was. 
right? And I love to cook. I grew up cooking. So I'm lucky that over the years I've been asked into the kitchen to cook with the wife. And they just take off the hijab. I mean, I've been people where they strip to a slip because it's 40, 50 degrees in the kitchen and let me cut tomatoes and cook with them. It's a different culture, and I, I love it. Michael and I got to spend time last summer with Bedouins in Wadi Rum, and they're characters, right? And we got to, we're invited to their homes, and I mean, it's a very different way of looking at that we often think of, oh, the women are oppressed, and it's a very different relationship, and you go, well, no, you can't look at Islam quite like that. I said, let's make the same stereotypes about Christianity, and let's, let's move on, right? So, and you can't. So. We just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. If you didn't get a chance to ask a question, Tom will stay up here and feel free to, to come up and, uh, and speak with him personally. But everyone have a good night. Thank you for coming. And Luis, thank you for everything. Luis is the man. How do I turn this off? I don't even know what time.